Awesome. All right, welcome everyone. How's everyone doing today? Come on, energy. Yes, we need the energy. Let's go. All right. So we have a treat for y'all. We actually brought hardware. We brought Edge hardware on site today. We've got a little Intel NUC here. Got a Raspberry Pi hanging over here. And we've got a little mini router. And we're going to see some magic going on. So thank you for coming. Our talk is called Pie in the Sky, Onboarding Edge Workloads into a Service Mesh, or specifically Ambient Mesh. Now, this talk specifically, and by the way, the quick shout out to Adam. He's like right there behind, say wave. Say hi to everyone. Anyways, um, so this talk is actually about taking workloads to the edge, but without Kubernetes. Because let's be real, we have a lot of types of workloads that exist today. We have uh, Kubernetes-based workloads. We have VM-based workloads. We have bare metal-based workloads. We have tiny services that have to run on small hardware. And so how do we make this all work? And so let's get into it. Yeah, so um, first we'll do introductions. I'm Nina Polshkova. I'm a software engineer at, on the Glue platform team at Solo. Um, so I work with Istio, onboarding VMs, um, some ambient stuff. Um, but you might, if you're on the dev Kubernetes listserv, you probably have seen me um, post a bunch of emails because of the enhancement freeze. Um, so I'm also the 129 enhancement lead. Um, and luckily we pass code free, so we're all good there. Um, and yeah, I've been on the enhancement, uh, on enhancement team for the past two or three releases? Yeah, since 127. So um, I also do some st stuff on the Kubernetes side. Fantastic, and before I introduce myself, I just wanna say a massive thank you, tremendous thank you to Nina for putting together all the effort and putting this demo together. Because if you actually look at the git commits, if you go look at the repo, you'll see that her chart is like all the way up here and mine's like all the way down there. So let's, let's give her a round of applause for putting that together. My name is Marino Wijay. I am a developer advocate at Solo. So you'll see me all around the globe talking about a variety of different networking related technologies, service mesh, API gateways, CNI, and even you know the regular networking stuff that we see in the hardware world, like this little router here. Uh, funnily enough, in trying to get our demo working, we ended up revisiting a lot of former network engineering capabilities, like using IP routes to make things work. And it's kind of funny because that's effectively how the subset of networking truly is, right? You're using a whole bunch of routes, you're using a whole bunch of uh, layer two and layer three functionality to make things move. But a lot of that intelligence doesn't live there. It all lives at the higher levels. So before we actually dig into the presentation, we have a quick survey for y'all. So uh, go, I didn't clear it. That's okay. It's okay. So go to that QR code, right? And we'd love to know what challenges come to mind and I want to see everyone pull up that QR code. I, I'm, I'm not seeing phones come up. Come on, let's go, let's go. Um, and tell us what you think challenges are when it comes to edge networking or edge computing. I think networking is a big challenge, but there are other challenges too that exist. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I'll give you all about 30 seconds to respond. And we should see that word cloud start popping up. And I'm seeing some good words. There's security, there's compute, there's latency. Okay, security is a big one. Scale. Updates, disconnect, DIL networking. I'm not sure what that is. Um, heterogeneity, orchestration. Yes, these are all interesting. Oh. Yeah, yeah. These and security happens to be the recurring theme through anything you do, whether it's networking in the data center, computing in the cloud, whatever it is. Security is always going to be the forefront of it. So we'll we'll actually dig into that. Next question. Join the quiz. Where's the quiz? Is it? Oh, OK. Oh. Are you currently using a service mesh in production? And if you don't know what a service mesh is, right? if you think about the way we connect our services together, are we getting answers? No? Yes? I think you have to end the next slide. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Awesome. OK. So a service mesh provides some key functionality, traffic management, security and observability. But the, you know, our regular networks do this already. So where is this actually happening? So when we think about our containers and the way we abstract them and layer them with services, we are effectively providing service to service connectivity, but well above that physical layer. And so in that fabric, that service mesh fabric, when we have different services that have to transact with each other, we have to find ways to know what's going on whenever there is a service failure we have to find ways to recover from that. We have to find ways to scale, but also scale the networking alongside it. 
But we also have to bake in things like identity and also bake in encryption in the way our services communicate with each other. So that's effectively what a service mesh is providing you today. Uh, you might have heard of the Istio service mesh. In fact, there's uh, Istio Day going on just a few halls or a few rooms down. A lot of great talks on service mesh as well. And you'll also see service mesh throughout the KubeCon conference. One more question for you, and we're going to get into the demo. Uh, oh, I feel like you <laughs> missed a question. I think there's one more. Keep going. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Last question for you. What's your current job title or function? We're interested to know who here is actually playing with edge technology. And so hopefully it starts. OK, there's some people typing. And so I think that edge computing can be uh, fall under the responsibility of a variety of different teams. It may fall into a branch team. It may fall into a platform team. It may fall into the world of DevOps as well. But we're seeing a whole different bunch of yeah, job titles. Chief pedals. Bottle Washer. I like that one. Chief <laughs> Bottle Washer. Awesome. OK. So thank you so much. Let's get into the actual talk. And we've got a demo for you. So when we're thinking about the edge, there are a variety of considerations. And hats off to Sergio Mendez, who actually put this slide together, or actually put this image together. It's from his book. Now, there's so many different considerations from the expertise to the people to the type of hardware to the type of applications to how many locations to how many different uh, KPIs you need to capture to really form that edge strategy, right? So as you decided to begin that journey, you have to also answer why. Why are you doing this? So you might have had this monolithic app that needs to be broken down into microservices, but also you need to address this latency concern because you're trying to make sure that services are accessible in a quick manner, in a non-latent manner. And so there are so many decision points to consider when building out an edge compute environment. I won't dig into the details, but if you want to know more, come chat with us after this talk. Having said that, let's jump into our demo. So that QR code there is actually going to lead you to a repo. You're welcome to follow along, but I don't think you're going to be able to in the 17 and 30 seconds we have left because we actually are going to onboard services into the mesh, and then we're going to see some action with some of this magical hardware here. So I'm assuming you've all pulled that up. I'm actually going to pull up a diagram here, and I'm going to pull up my terminal off to this. This is going to be fun. Do you have the local host? Yeah. Yep. And gotta close this. Gotta make this bigger. And I don't know why it's looking like that. Oops. Oh, can you do that? Nice. Nice. It's still pretty small, but I think it's fine. Okay. All right. So can you make that bigger actually, the canines? If you do. Yeah. yeah. All right. So what we I'm sorry for my screen real estate. I'm using a very <laughs> small uh, MacBook here. But in our little diagram here, what we actually have going on is a cluster running kind that has Kubernetes, obviously, and Istio install. But Istio is running a special mode called Ambient Mesh. That Ambient Mesh enables something called sidecarless Istio. So in traditional Istio, or normal Istio, you actually have this sidecar proxy that runs alongside your your actual um, sidecar container or your main container. And I can show you this is in the way of, if you actually look at the output of the pods here, I'm using canines, by the way. Um, there is a pod here called not sleep, and we see that it has two out of two containers running in that pod. There's one container that's actually the function of not sleep, and there's a secondary container that acts as the proxy, the sidecar proxy. However, there are situations in this world where having a sidecar is actually not valuable for your workloads, and you need a sidecarless approach because you don't want to be intrusive. You have to think about your operational instances and concerns. And at the same time, onboarding sidecars means more hardware requirements because more CPU and memory. So Ambient Mesh enters the chat, and we can effectively do a lot of different things here. But in our case, we actually have this little setup where we've got, well, the second Raspberry Pi is not here. But there is one Raspberry Pi that actually will be onboarded with something called a Z-Tunnel in Istio. The Z-Tunnel here is like a, um, a node-level router that effectively proxies all connections for that, that workload, that edge-based workload, which is a Raspberry Pi. But that Raspberry Pi isn't in the mesh. It's not actually inside of this cluster. It's outside. It's external. It's this little device right here. So we're going to onboard this into the mesh very shortly. But before we do, I want to talk about a few other things and how we get something into the mesh. 
So inside of Service Mesh, we have to expose different artifacts using something called the ingress gateway. So if we want to access services inside of a mesh, we'll use an Istio ingress gateway. Now, in the case of actually attaching services into a mesh that are external to a cluster, we actually have to expose our control plane to that endpoint. And we actually have to use something called an east-west gateway. So the east-west gateway is, is basically a control plane path for us to be able to pick up updates, certificate information for the sidecar or the Z-tunnel, identity information, policy information, routing information to know where to get to our services. And so what we end up having to do is we use the east-west gateway to expose our control plane in Istio to get those updates for our Z-tunnel that lives on our Raspberry Pi. So um, there are a few artifacts here that I could dig into, but I'm thinking about time, and I think we should move on to the next part. So I'll pass it along to Nina. Yeah, um, so uh, Marino mentioned we're gonna onboard um, our, our Raspberry Pi into our mesh. So there's a couple of things uh, that we need to do to onboard. So let me just make this full screen. Oh. Um, so there's two parts. There's uh, the onboarding steps that happen on the cluster side, and then we have to copy some config over and then actually run the Z tunnel on, on the uh, Raspberry Pi side. So if I go back, um, where's the, um, or actually, can we do the split view again? Let's see. Oh, the side by side? Yeah. Uh, Here, I can do it for you. Cool. So um, on the cluster side, we need to first expose STOD, uh, the, our control plane, like Marino was saying. So the way we expose STOD is we use two Istio resources, a gateway resource, which configures all the inco incoming traffic into the cluster, and a virtual service, which is the basic building block that um, determines our routing logic. So our gateway resource, we've already applied this. Um, this is uh, called STOD gateway, very aptly, because uh, it's responsible for exposing STOD. Um, and here we define uh, our two ports, so 1512 and 1517. So these are the two ports that we're exposing um, in order to let the Pi communicate to our control plane. And we're gonna use pass-through mode here. So um, because we have pass-through mode enabled, we also need a virtual service that matches this config. So if you go to our virtual services, this again is just like an Istio CR that um, Istio provides to build routing logic. Um, we select our gateway that I showed earlier and we have our TLS route defined. So on the TLS route, again, we have our, our, our two ports and um, we have uh, the STOD um, uh, host destination. So um, that uh, has already been created on the cluster side. The second thing we have to do is create a service account. So if we look at the service accounts we have, uh, can't type. Um, if we go all the way down to the, the Pi namespace that we've created, so in the Pi namespace, we have a Pi service account, and this is what we're gonna use um, in order to identify the Pi. So later on in the demo, we're gonna apply an authorization policy and use this uh, service account to um, identify our Pi. So this is again created on the cluster side. This service account is also used to create a short-lived Istio token, that's just like a JOT token that's used in initial bootstrapping. So we're gonna copy that token on to the Pi, and then um, the initial bootstrapping is gonna happen, and then we're gonna do a CSR request to Istio to actually get the certs. So uh, by default, the short-lived token only lives for an hour. For the demo purpose, we've um, increased the timeout to 24 hours just to make sure everything stays in a good state. But um, that's what this is doing here. And then finally, uh, we need a workload entry. So again, this is another Istio resource um, that we have defined, and this is how Istio represents the Pi in the mesh. So here we have um, the, uh, the labels that the workload entry is gonna use. Um, you can see the address is our, our Pi address, so it's on the same network as our Linux box. And um, we, uh, because we're running a Z-tunnel on the Pi, we also need this special label that says ambient redirection enabled. So this is gonna tell our cluster that the Z-tunnel knows how to speak HBone, and uh, we're gonna use HBone as our, our secure connection. Cool, so that's basically all that happens cluster side. Uh, let's take a look at what's happening on the Pi. Oh, so I think we have to SSH in again. Okay. So. Um, but all those logs are actually z -tunnel logs because we were testing the demo earlier, so we're gonna, um, I think we have to CD into the directory. Uh, I think setup, no, no, not that one. Uh, uh, setup z -tunnel. yep, okay. 
Cool. Um, yeah, so we, we can see it run live. Um, let me make this a little oh, bigger. No, disconnected again. So, oh. <laughs> yeah, so this, this is why it's hacky, but at the end of the day, we'll make it work. All right, there we see the end of it. Ah, wait, uh, kill it. Oh, sorry, did that again. Um, yes. All right. Okay, now it's running. Um, so the command I ran, if we scroll back up, um, is doing all the steps on the right. So it's copying over uh, the service account, the config files to the right directories. We're editing Etsy host to have that SNI um, SDOD um, thing that we saw in the, the uh, virtual service. Um, and then we're also um, installing the, the dot, dot .deb um, ztunnel that I've included in the, the repo. So um, a quick side note, ztunnel is a Rust-based um, project proxy, proxy yeah. <laughs> that um, uh, you can actually build on the Pi itself. Um, it takes like 30 minutes. Um, it's super lightweight compared to Envoy. If you've ever tried building Envoy, it's not a fun time. But uh, ztunnel is very easy to build, and you can even build it on like a, a tiny little Raspberry Pi. Um, so uh, the address that I have here is actually the east-west gateway address because, again, like we need to get XDS updates from our control plane to our Pi. So we're um, because this is a flat network, we're just writing the, the uh, east-west gateway service IP directly. And this is what uh, we're editing um, in Etsy host to, to set. So if we go back to our logs, we can see that we've connected. Um, and we should be and... able to test connectivity to yes, our service. Yes, yeah. All right. Okay, let's... So... Or is this, uh, wait, is this the right? Okay, uh, yeah, let, let's check that we got local host because I, I think I don't see. Uh, you don't see an entry? Yeah. Uh, where would I, uh, is I If you go to the browser to local host. So um, ZTunnel also exposes an admin panel um, that has. Oh, oh no. no. What happened? The demo gods. <sighs> wait, if you open a new SSH connection with the, the 15,000 one. Maybe oh, that's, yeah, that's, yeah right. that's what happened. Okay. okay. Problem fixed. Yay. All right. Here okay. we go. So we are able to get the config dump uh, directly from Istio D, which actually tells us a number of things. So I'll make this really large for you, and I'll be quick because we're kind of running out of time. But if I did a control F and I looked for hello, oh no, it's not. Yeah. Like... Wait, I think that's the wrong path on the Z tunnel. If you go back, that's what it is. Uh... So uh, in the GitHub, just real quick, or is, do you know where the GitHub is? Um, I think the file path is slightly different. I think we're using an old version. Oh, uh, no way. Wait, so, well, like, just exit then. Let's see. Uh, uh, no, it should be. Is this the, the service IP? Let's double check. 26, uh, yeah. yeah. Live troubleshooting for y'all. <laughs> I promise you, literally worked five minutes before we actually got on stage. <laughs> I see, yeah, we can uh, maybe just run the, the recording, but it looks like it, uh, it not, didn't connect. It's not connecting, because it's not getting the updates from XDS. Uh, oh, interesting. OK. So let, let's talk through what actually was supposed to happen. We were actually hoping that <laughs> through all of this fun exercise, you would see these little LEDs light up. But something must have broke. Maybe, I don't know. Anyways, one of the interesting things about how this all functions is that I'm making a call from either my Pi to um, the, the kind cluster or the other way around. And while she's figuring that out, um, what's actually going to happen is, as I make that call a curl to, um, let's say, a service that's running in my, my kind cluster, I should get a result. I will get a result, as expected, because the ztunnel that lives on this Pi is connected to istod that runs on this cluster over here. Now, on the flip side, I can run a Python-based server that's actually connected to this LED, and I can run a curl pod on this, on this box. And what I would do is I'd just SSH a shell into the curl pod, and effectively just you know, run a curl against the Pi IP or the Pi's uh, DNS name, and, a, and specifically a path. And that path is just basically turning on the LEDs and doing something. But that's supposed to demonstrate the bidirectional functionality and communication path between a, a non-Kubernetes-based workload that lives in the mesh. And look, you know, the magic of Nina, it's, it seems to be working <laughs> I, I have no idea. I don't think I changed anything, but... Uh... Uh, do you want to look at the local host again? 
Yeah, let's take a quick look. I mean, we've got five minutes. So um, basically, because we're on a flat network, uh, on the kind cluster side, we've exposed the pod cider and the service cider. So our Pi is like going through um, our, like the Linux host like, has an IP. We're routing everything in the pod and service cider there. Um, so technically speaking, if I did a curl, actually, we'll see. Control R, curl, hello. Yep, that looks good. Yay. And if you notice, <laughs> you see the successful hello, right? I'm going to skip the policy because I think yeah, we should fine. just go to the LED. But what the policy was supposed to do is actually block this indirect, or sorry, this direct connection and expect a header. And our header would have been Istio is cool that we would have applied before we made that curl request and it would have gone through, but all other requests would have failed. And this would have been from the Pi directly to a service in Ambient. Now we're going to do the reverse, and I'm going to let Nina kind of take us through the magic here. Yeah, so um, on the Pi side, so like instead of applying a, a policy on the cluster side, we saw the Pi can talk to the cluster, so now we're going to go in the other direction. We're going to have the cluster talk to uh, the Pi. So the way that we're going to do this is um, I've, I'm going to run this Python, Python server on uh, port 8080 on the Pi, and then on the cluster side, I've created the service. So you can technically use a service entry here as well, but um, to simplify the demo, we, we just created a service because um, I think everyone here is familiar with Kubernetes resources. So um, we're uh, using the workload entry that I showed you earlier to uh, as the selector here, and um, we're using port 8080, which is what the, um, the LED server is running on. So um, I'm just going to check that I don't have any authorization policies before I... Cool. So we don't have any authorization policies. We're going to apply one later. And the thing I'm going to do is I'm going to send some traffic from sleep to um, our little LED server. And we send the request, the LED slash. Wait, Exciting. Why? why is only half of it like? <laughs> oh, <laughs> only half of it? Oh, well, we can debug that. Wait, I know. I know what's wrong. Uh, is it because I changed it to? Uh, uh, yeah, it's only 50 pixels. So let's oh, uh, yeah, quickly yeah, live right. debug it. I didn't pull down uh, the latest. I didn't do a git pull before we started this. I'm sorry. All right. Marina, Marina. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, I'm using uh, NeoPixels or uh, like uh, uh, the, uh, yeah, uh, this library here <laughs> to um, run the server, as, um, to change the, the lights, um, but it's running a Flask server, so that's how we're getting, like we're sending a GET request and changing the, the colors. Um, so let's run that again. And uh, now if we send the same request, everything should light up. Woo! Oh, live debugging. <laughs> So that's all great, but like that doesn't really show any uh, cool authorization policies, which Istio does really well. So what I'm going to do now is um, on the Linux side, I am, or is this the right, uh, is this KubeCon? Yeah. Um, uh, we're going to apply the, not a teapot one, wait, uh, policies, which one? Okay, apply uh, the... L4 one. So the Z tunnel doesn't support L7 policies, so we can't like block on headers or anything. Um, we have to block on uh, just the service account. So um, I'm going to apply this, and then let's just cat it to take a look at it. Or actually, we'll take a look at it in K9s. Or no, never mind. Let's cat it. <laughs> uh, cool. So the thing that this authorization policy is doing again, it's a Istio resource. Um, we're going to deny everything coming from our sleep app. So the curl I sent from before was coming from the sleep app. So now when I send the, the request again, we should be blocked because we have this deny policy. Um, so going back, uh, if I send it again, I get a connection receive failure. And if we look at our Z uh, tunnel logs, we can see that um, we got an RBAC rejected. Because this is an L4 policy, we don't get a nice like 403 response. We just get the connection um, rejected. Um, so now the last thing we're going to do is, it's kind of sad that the lights aren't working. Um, if we try this again from a different um, app, like NetShoot, um, I should be able to send, uh, where is it? Uh, do I have it open actually somewhere else? I think I have it running here. Uh, here? Yeah. So I should be able to send the same thing from the NetShoot um, thing that I'm, I'm running, also in the default namespace, but it's going to use a different service account. So when I run it, we get the same uh, the lights flashing, and looking back at the Z tunnel logs very br briefly, we see that this is coming from the uh, default default uh, service account, so that's why it's getting allowed in. So we can see that the L4 policy is getting applied, and our, our lights are correctly working. Awesome. All right, so let's wrap up. I think we've got like one minute before Stephen comes on stage and tells me to get off. Um, I can't find my deck. Oh, there we go. There we go.
Okay, so um, we would love to get some feedback on this talk because we want to make this better for the next time around. So please go to that QR code and let us know how we can make this demo great for KubeCon Paris next year, which I hope to see you all at. And finally, if you want to know more, like if you want to dig more into Istio, Ambient Mesh, we're actually going to be at the KubeCon booth, uh, D11, come visit us. We're there like for the next three days. We're actually gonna be at the Cilium booth as well over at CiliumCon. Come chat with us there as well. Also, I'm doing a talk at CiliumCon today in literally half an hour. Um, so come check that out. It's called BGP, or sorry, um, what's smoother than you know, your, espresso, uh, your morning espresso pools? It's BGP and bridging gaps. So come check that out. It's over at the CiliumCon session. And we want to thank you all for your time. So we hope you have a great rest of your edge day, whatever other colo events you're going to, as well as KubeCon. We hope to see you around. Take care.